So it's important to chew, chew, chew. Why? Because there are no teeth in the stomach. And when you chew, you break the food down to tiny particles, which means there's a greater surface area for the enzymes to work on. And also, when you chew, you are mixing the food with saliva, and, and in the saliva are these enzymes, so the breakdown can begin to happen. There's something else. When you're chewing, messages are going to the brain. And the brain says, ah, oh, there's a bit of starch in there. Ah, oh, there's a bit of fat in there. Ah, oh, there's a bit of protein in there. And then it sends messages down to the pancreas, down to the stomach saying, yep, yep, there's a bit of protein coming. Yeah, there's a bit. Can you see what's happening here? And the other organs are getting ready. But three chews swallow, three chews swallow. These organs are saying, what's coming? And the brain says, oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, we, we don't know. It's not in there. <laughs> Can you see there are several reasons why we need to chew, 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 chew. Coming down the esophagus, there's a gateway in the stomach. It's in a double, double layered gateway and it's called the cardiac sphincter. And the cardiac sphincter opens when the muscles tighten to let the food through. And then as we get into the stomach, we get another stage of digestion. So the stomach is an alkaline, no, acid environment. In fact, that's the only part of the body that is acid. It's the only part of the body that should be acid. And tomorrow night, we're gonna be looking at the acid alkaline balance in the body. So the only part of our body that should be acid is the stomach. And if someone says to me, I've got a very acid stomach, I say, fantastic. It should be. But how do you know it's acid? Well, it hurts. Well, it shouldn't hurt. You see, we've got a thick mucosa law lining on that stomach. So you shouldn't feel your acid. I can't feel my acid. Someone else said, well, it keeps coming up. Well, that's not the acid, the acid's not the problem. And by the way, if it keeps coming up, it can burn holes in the esophagus and the person can get an ulcerated esophagus. Can you see now it's not the acid? The problem's not the acid, the problem is that gait. So why isn't that strong? Well, there are many people today who are eating breakfast like a pauper, lunch like a pauper, and the tea is the king and the queen together because they're so busy. And so when they lay down or sit down in their easy chair to watch the television and fall asleep and then they go to bed, there's this huge amount of food in the stomach. And when the sun goes down, our body knows it goes down. And when the sun goes down, the whole body slows down. When the sun goes down, digestion doesn't happen as effect effectively and efficiently as it does at lunchtime and as it does at, at breakfast. You've heard of circadian rhythm? Circadian rhythm is set in our body by light and dark signals. When the sun goes down, there's a whole lot of messages going into the brain. So di we don't digest as well as an evening as we do at breakfast and lunch. So having a big meal and it start, gravity causes it to push against those little valves there and it weakens it. And that cardiac sphincter, it's called the cardiac sphincter because of its relationship, its nearness to the heart. It's a muscle like this. And when it tenses, it opens. And when it's relaxed, it's closed. Now the mineral that is a muscle relaxant is magnesium. So everyone that comes to Misty Mountain Health Retreat that's got reflux or heartburn it's called, because we serve breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen and tea like a pauper, and we give them magnesium supplements three times a day and just before bed, they go home without the heartburn. Easy fixed. I had one guy come and he'd been on Nexium or the equivalent for 15 years. Is it working? 15 years? And by the way, you know what they're finding now? Long-term antacids is causing or contributing to colon cancer. 
because the protein's not getting broken down because there's not enough acid to break it down. And so partially digested protein goes all the way down here. Extra bacteria has to be created to try and deal with the partially digested protein and that can contribute to damaging the wall of the colon. Whew. I have never met anyone with an over acid stomach. It actually doesn't happen. By the way, dogs, they've got about six times higher acid content in their stomach than humans. Do they get reflux? Do they get stomach ulcers? No. <laughs> they need that extra acid because they're meat eaters and they need a lot of acid to break that down and get it through that body quickly. So let's have a look at the stomach. Let's have a look at how it works. So what is the food that breaks down in the stomach? The food that breaks down in the stomach is protein. That's actually the only food that's broken down in the stomach because starch digestion begins under the action of tylen, but it's put on hold in the acid stomach. The lining of the stomach has big folds like this. And those folds are lined with gastric glands. And two thirds of those gastric glands is mucus, releasing mucus. There's your thick mucosa wall to protect the lining of the stomach against the acid. Now these glands down here, they release hydrochloric acid. And if you were to put one drop of hydrochloric acid on your skin, it would burn a hole in your skin. You see why God made it so that there's a thick mucosa wall? Now something else that's released from those glands is pepsinogen. Pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid unite, but only in a very acid environment. And they, when they unite, they release pepsin. And pepsin is the enzyme that breaks down protein. Can you see why the pepsin's not released here? It'll start eat up your stomach wall. So the hydrochloric acid released, the pepsinogens released, they unite to produce pepsin, and it's pepsin that breaks down the protein. Pepsin will only work or only be activated, I should say, in a very acid environment. When we undergo proper digestion through thorough chewing and appropriate enzymatic activity, we minimize the risk of damage to the stomach lining. This protective function is vital for maintaining gastrointestinal health and preventing conditions like gastritis or ulcers that can result from prolonged exposure to high acidity. So if someone's drinking with their meals, they water down the enzymes in the stomach and the stomach knows that so digestion stops all the fluid has to be got rid of and then it has to go back to digesting the food and isn't that a nausea habit drinking with the meals every time michael and i go to a restaurant the first question we're asked is what what are you going to have to drink and we always say uh no we've we've already drank Oh, well, we'll just bring you water. Now we let them, because otherwise they'll never leave us alone. <laughs> We're such a fast society. People are busy, 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 no, no time to drink, sit down to eat. Oh, haven't drunk. Is that right? <laughs> we, should be, we should stop drinking half an hour before the meal. And that means that we've got a nice acid environment. And then resume drinking one and a half hours to two hours after the meal. If you sit to eat your meal well hydrated, you will not need to drink with your meals. In fact, at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, we don't serve water with the meals. And I have people say, I keep reaching for the water. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's the habit. That's what we're gonna look at on Saturday morning, rewiring that, and you can rewire your brain. But I'd like to speak a little bit <clears throat> about hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid isn't just to unite with pepsinogen to produce pepsin, hydrochloric acid is antifungal, it's antibacterial. So that if any bacteria happens to be on the food coming into the stomach, it'll wipe it out. 
So that's why it's very important to have nice, strong hydrochloric acid. Another thing that can exhaust hydrochloric acid is constant eating. You see, digestion, approximately, there's been lots of research to prove this, it takes three to four hours to digest a meal. And then your stomach loves a one hour rest. That means we should be leaving about a five hour break between a meal. And the only way you can do this is to have a high fiber diet. We looked at this last night. To have generous amounts of protein and to have your healthy fats. What are your healthy fats? Fats as they come from the hand of the creator. So there's your nuts and your seeds, your avocado, your coconuts, and the two oils extracted from the flesh of the plant which have been eaten for centuries is your coconut and your olive oil. So it depends where you live, I guess, what oil you grow up on. We live in Australia, so take your pick. Personally, I like the taste of olive oil a little better. These are the three foods that keep the food in the stomach longer. Fiber, because it slowly releases the glucose. Protein, because it's in the stomach that protein is broken down. And fats, because it coats the food so it takes a little bit longer for the enzymes to get in there. And that allows us not to faint between meals because we're, we're getting the nutrients. And by the way, even when the stomach's empty, as you'll see a little bit later on, the food's getting absorbed down here, so even when the stomach's empty, we're not going to die of starvation, you know. <laughs> we're, we're still getting those nutrients going through. Effective digestion is critical in regulating energy levels and managing hunger. When food is adequately broken down and absorbed, the body can access the nutrients it needs to function optimally. This prevents energy crashes and excessive cravings between meals, as the body efficiently converts food into fuel. Many people who feel hungry two hours after a meal, it's often thirst because your body doesn't know the difference between thirst and hunger. So it's only two meals, two hours since a meal and you're feeling hungry, have a drink of water. Dr. Michael Molesley, you've probably heard of him. He has a few shows on SBS. He's just written a book called The Fast Diet. And he talks about fasting between meals. And he talks about time-restricted eating. Have you heard of time-restricted eating? It's actually quite popular now. It's eating two meals in about a six-hour period in a 24-hour day. So that's what we suggest, and we do at our health retreat. Main meal at breakfast, another main meal at lunch. And if you have something at night, because maybe you're working hard and you weren't able to get a decent lunch, just have something light at night, because you're just about to go to bed. So soup, bowl of soup's good, smoothie or a herb tea, something very light. Now, there's something else that's released in the parietal glands down here, because remember, two thirds of those glands are releasing mucus. It's the intrinsic factor. So what's the intrinsic factor? Let me give you the B12 story, because B12 is a is a bacteria and it's not often understood. So let me use my fingers. This is B12 and this is R protein. And in food, R protein and B12 are connected. And when R protein and B12 get into the stomach, the hydrochloric acid releases them. So now B12 is released from the R protein. And in the stomach, the intrinsic factor is released. So here's intrinsic factor. Now B12 and intrinsic factor float together all the way through the small intestine and getting to the end of the small intestine, intrinsic factor and B12 connect. And when they are connected, then they get absorbed into the body at the la last part of the small intestine. It's called the ileum. And then when it gets into the circulation of the blood, it's taken to the liver and it gets caught up in the enterohepatic circulation, which is a circulating effect. Do you know a lot of the B12 you eat is just recycled? So much so that someone can have no B12 in their diet for 30 years before they show a deficiency. So most people with B12 
deficiency, it's because they don't have enough hydrochloric acid or they're not making the intrinsic factor. You see, meat eaters and non-meat eaters alike <laughs> can suffer from B12 deficiency. And Dr. Neil Nedley, you might have heard of him, famous American doctor, he's written a book called Proof Positive. And he shows in there the research that is proving that B12 can be found in rainwater, B12 can be found on homegrown vegetables, on apples picked off trees, B12 can be found in organically grown root vegetables. So they're the facts that I'm giving you on B12. So let's move on. Coming out of the stomach, here's a little valve down here. It's called the pyloric sphincter. And the pyloric sphincter has sensors. So the pyloric sphincter will only open when it knows the food's broken down to a certain state. And when it gets the messages, the food's broken down to a certain state, it opens. Let's say this is breakfast, and little by little it comes in. But let's say mid-morning someone has a biscuit and a cup of tea or a sandwich and a cup of tea. How many Aussies do that? Or maybe they're really healthy and it's an apple and a handful of nuts. Whatever it is, pyloric sphincter quickly shuts. Oops, something's just come in. It's not broken down. And that will stay shut until this newcomer gets broken down to the right state and ah, and then it can open again. And about an hour later, what happens? Lunch. Lunch comes in. Quick, shut the gate. Something's just come in and it's not broken down properly. Do you know what the research is showing? Breakfast, some remnant of breakfast can be still in the stomach at the end of the day when people are eating all day long. We've got one stomach. Cows can eat all day long because they've got about four or five stomachs. Humans have one stomach. So now what's happening when we get into the duodenum. A lot of things are happening in the duodenum. The duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. So this is the duodenum here. And notice you've got the liver and the gallbladder connects with the neck of the pancreas. Here's pancreas. And there are enzymes coming from the gallbladder, basically from the liver and the pancreas. The so interaction of these one. organs within the duodenum is crucial for efficient nutrient absorption and digestion. When the digestive system functions optimally, it can enhance overall health and prevent various gastrointestinal issues. So let's have a look at what they're doing. So the next organ is the duodenum. It's not really the organ, but it's actually where these other organs drop into. So let's begin by looking at the liver, which as you can see, releases into the duodenum via the bile duct. Now when you get to the duodenum, now we're in an alkaline environment. We're back to alkaline now. Remember, the only acid is stomach. So what's the liver releasing? The, re the liver releases bile. And bile breaks down your unsaturated fat. Whereas the saturated fat, remember where its breakdown begins? In the mouth. So what bile does, it breaks down your unsaturated fat into tiny little particles. Pancreas. As you can see by my illustration here, the pancreas is also releasing enzymes into the duodenum. So what does the pancreas release? It releases pancreatic lipase. And pancreatic lipase further breaks down your unsaturated fats. So the bile breaks it down to small particles and the pancreatic lipase further breaks it down. Then it can be absorbed into the blood which we'll look at in a minute. Also, the pancreas releases pancreatic amylase. Now, do you remember what tylen is? It's a salivary amylase. That tylen is a salivary amylase and it starts, starts the starch digestion, whereas the pancreatic amylase, it finalizes starch breakdown. 
Remember, starch breakdown begins in the mouth, put on hold in the acid stomach, now comes into the duodenum, and the pancreatic amylase finalizes starch digestion. The pancreas also releases trypsin. And trypsin is an enzyme that finalizes protein digestion. Remember where protein digestion began? Under pepsin in the stomach. But also the pancreas releases chymotrypsin. And chymotrypsin is another enzyme that breaks down protein. I've got some good news, it doesn't get much more difficult than this. That's it for today. Prioritizing the act of chewing, understanding the role of magnesium, safeguarding the stomach lining, enhancing digestion, and utilizing time-restricted eating can significantly improve digestive health. Furthermore, recognizing the critical roles that the liver and pancreas play in digestion allows for a more comprehensive approach to dietary habits and nutrition. By focusing on these elements, individuals can foster better digestion, increased energy levels, and overall well-being.